Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we're going to look at the case of the Gold Leaf Lady. With me is Professor Stephen Browdy, who is the author of The Gold Leaf Lady, an anthology of uh, articles about parapsychological case studies. He is also the author of a number of other books, important books in parapsychology, including Immortal Remains, The Limits of Influence, First Person Plural, ESP, and psychokinesis and crimes of reason. Stephen is the former chair, chairman of the philosophy department at the University of Maryland at Baltimore County. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you, Jeff. Good to be back. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. And, and I know the Gold Leaf Lady case is very special, uh, largely, I think, because of your interest in psychokinesis and also because it's certainly got to be one of the most unusual cases ever reported in the parapsychology literature. It's certainly the most unusual one I personally investigated, mm -hmm. and it's a very dramatic case of macro PK, macro psychokinesis. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what we're talking about for the benefit of our viewers who are probably in the dark is, is a woman that uh, we'll call Katie, who uh, it would appear as if gold leaf just formed uh, around her body. The way it would happen would be sometimes it would just appear instantaneously and spontaneously. Uh, other times her skin would initially glisten a little bit as if um, little droplets were appearing and then suddenly out of those droplets there would be splotches of um, this thin leaf, this mm -hmm. golden colored leaf. And you studied her for a number of years. Yes, for about five years. She was originally, as, as I recall, uh, came to the attention of our mutual friend, Dr. Berthold Schwartz. Right. Uh, she lived in Florida, not far from Bert's office. And Bert is, was kind of a magnet for psychic subjects of all kinds. Mm -hmm. And he documented Katie's phenomena uh, scrupulously for many years. Mm -hmm. And then you got involved. In, well, in he knew I was interested in macro PK, and he... Yeah got in touch with me, and Katie actually did more than just manifest this gold leaf. There were several reasons why I was interested. One was that she was a good all-around psychic. She worked with the police to solve crimes. She could apparently make seeds germinate in her hands, bend metal. Um, and even though she had only a first-grade education and was functionally illiterate, when she was in a mediumistic trance, she could write out what looked like quatrains from Nostradamus in medieval French. Now, medieval French, that, that's really, in effect, a case of xenoglossy. Uh, apparently so. Mm -hmm. Not responsive xenoglossy. Someone actually once yeah. tried to speak French to her while she was in trance, and that didn't work. Mm. Um, but she couldn't even do more than write her own name in, in English. So this was really quite remarkable. In, indeed. Well. I know one of the issues that became paramount as you began looking at the materializations of, of the gold leaf is whether it was an apport, uh, meaning uh, it had come from elsewhere, right. or a materialization formed out of uh, pure air. Right. And that remains a mystery and probably the central mystery about the case, really. Mm -hmm. Because w one of the things I know that you discovered is that this gold leaf looking substance. You had it analyzed numerous times numerous by different times. laboratories. Right. And uh, let's talk about those results. It turns out that the material is actually brass. That means 70% 80% copper, 20% zinc. Um, I've had it analyzed under scanning electric microscopes. I've had it subject to um, the analysis of the Johns Hopkins Material Science Department. Uh, Friends at NIST and my home campus of UMBC subjected it to uh, chemical analytic uh, methods. What, what is NIST? The National Institutes of Standards and Technology. Uh -huh. Yeah, where the, one would expect they'd have very good laboratories. Very good laboratories. Yeah. Only limited time to look at the material, as yeah. you can well imagine. 
Well, you come to a, a, a material scientist and say, can you examine this? They're probably happy to do it. But when they hear the story of how it exudes off of a lady's skin, that, that may put them off a bit. Well, when I went to Johns Hopkins, the material science folks there, they were initially interested in the whole case. Yeah. And I wanted them to take a look and see if there was something conspicuously unusual about the material. Mm -hmm. uh, they looked at it carefully and they determined that it had the same granular, rolled granular structure as the kind of golden colored leaf you can buy in art supply stores. That's a cheap substitute for real gold leaf for uh, gilding picture frames and things of that sort. Mm -hmm. And when they discovered that it was similar or if not identical to the so-called composition leaf or Dutch metal that you could buy commercially, they lost interest. Sure. But not because of the unusual nature of the case, just because as material, as material, it wasn't particularly interesting. Yeah, it would be great <laughs> if it had a unique molecular structure that was never duplicated anywhere else. What bothered me is that they assumed that because it had ordinary molecular structure that um, it was probably not paranormal, which is a non sequitur, because presumably something paranormally produced could have normal underlying structure, just as mm -hmm. something that is paranormally uh, produced, uh, a rather normally, normally produced, produced, could have an abnormal structure. Well, it's the first thing that might pop into anybody's mind is if, if this is the same material that could be purchased at an art supply store, perhaps Katie was just very gifted at sleight of hand and making you think that it materialized. Well, a couple of things. We'll get to the sleight of hand thing in a moment. Yeah. One of the important results of the Johns Hopkins analysis was that it ruled out one skeptical explanation of what Katie is doing. Mm -hmm. Some suggested she might have dissolved some brass in a liquid, applied it to her body, and then when the liquid evaporated, you'd see this material appearing on her skin. Yeah. But as the scientists at Hopkins pointed out, if she had done that, it would have a crystal and not a granular, a rolled granular structure. Mm. So we could eliminate that. Well, because especially as you point out, the skin started to glisten. Sometimes, yes. Yeah. yeah. So it was not an unreasonable initial conjecture. Right. Uh, as for sleight of hand, the material is very clingy and staticky. So mm -hmm. as a magician subsequently confirmed, and as anybody could easily confirm anyway, it's very difficult to manipulate mm -hmm. and transfer from one part of your body to another, say from your hand to another hand. But maybe the people who are putting it on picture frames and so on are good at that. Well, it is possible to get it off your hands. but. Yeah whether it's easy to manipulate by sleight of hand, mm. to first of all conceal and then make it appear uh -huh. where you need it to appear. I mean, we had a magician, a skilled magician try it and uh, couldn't do it. Well, I suppose the important thing is that you actually you know, videotaped and observed and numerous other people observed the, this, we'll call it gold leaf, right. although it's actually brass leaf, uh, forming a, a, as it happened. That's what I think is most remarkable about the case. Many people, people I know, people I don't know, uh, would see it appear spontaneously and instantaneously in great quantities on mm -hmm. Katie. Some people have told me they would hold her hand, and while they were holding her hand, large amounts of it would appear on her uh, forearm. Um, also, by the way, another reason we think, well, some people suggested that Katie might have actually been sweating this or mm -hmm. exuding it from her body. Yeah. I think we can rule that out too because she'd have to have, first of all, lethal amounts of copper and zinc in her system mm -hmm. to produce the quantities that she produced. Yeah. And medical tests of various kinds never turned up any relevant abnormalities. Mm -hmm. But also, sometimes, apparently, although I never saw this myself, the material would appear on Katie's clothes like her jeans or in sealed containers around the room. Bert Schwartz uh, had various kinds of uh, little mi mini labs or sealed mm -hmm. bottles, and I saw large quantities of the foil in the bottles. Inside of a sealed bottle, yes. so she would be nearby when that occurred, I yes. assume. Yes, yes. He might leave the sealed bottle with her. Yes, he would do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, this happened over and over and over, although I'm sorry I never saw it. Yeah. But I th Bert may have been credulous, but I don't think he was that credulous, mm -hmm. and I th I'm certain he was honest. Mm -hmm. Well, the intriguing thing to me, um, considering this as an instance of psychokinesis, is uh, how unusual it is, the chemical composition, and, and when you look at all of the cases of apports and psychokinesis together, it, it almost seems as if there's no limit. 
no physical limit that we know of as to what might be accomplished. Well, that's one of the reasons I'm so interested in macro PK, because I think it forces us to grapple more than we might be comfortable grappling mm -hmm. uh, with the issue of just what the limits of PK might be, how extensive can our influence on the world around us actually be. And as you say, I think we don't know. No, it would seem, and, uh, and we should talk about this because you've done an extensive analysis of the psychological motivations behind, because a lot of people are thinking, well, brass foil, so what? What's, what's the purpose? What, why? Right. Well, Bert was a psychiatrist, mm -hmm. and his interest in the case was psychiatric. Mm -hmm. He wanted to know what the psychodynamics of Katie's phenomena were, including the medieval French uh, automatic writing. Mm -hmm. um, he never concentrated particularly on the evidence as evidence for the genuineness of the phenomena. Mm -hmm. He took it for granted that the phenomena were genuine. And he seems to, if, if people look at his publications, he seems to have attracted and been open to many phenomena that other people would simply ignore because they were too bizarre. Right, right. So, God bless Bert. Yeah. Um, but he revealed some interesting facts about Katie's life that make it intelligible <clears throat> why the phenomena appeared in the form that they did. Mm -hmm. First of all, Katie was in a difficult marriage. Yeah. Um, and in many respects, her case is like a classic poltergeist case. And as you know, and as we've discussed, a poltergeist profile is that there's usually somebody with some serious emotional issues, typically a, a teenager or mm -hmm. adolescent. No conventional way of getting rid of these pent-up emotions, and so they erupt in spontaneous psychokinetic um, manner. So, mm -hmm. uh, of course, it's not just teenagers and adolescents who have serious emotional difficulties, and marriages can be a fertile ground for the same thing. Yeah. And shortly after Katie got married to her current husband, Tom, uh, poltergeist-like things started happening around her house, mm -hmm. and uh, objects were disappearing and appearing, moving around, rearranging themselves, and so on. And one day, a carving set appeared out of nowhere, and Katie's husband said to her, what good is it if it isn't money? And then two days later, Katie's body started to break out in what looked like gold leaf. Mm -hmm. So my pop psychological analysis of this is that symbolically, this satisfies Katie's husband's demand for something valuable, but Katie doesn't really have to bear the responsibility of being the goose that laid the golden egg, and, which I think would be even more burdensome than just being a PK star. It adds a lot of psychological right. pressure. I know that from uh, Keith Harari, who right. worked in Silver Futures forecasting right. with Russell Targ and did nine perfect series in a row, followed by nine misses <laughs> yes, absolutely. In, in, in a row. And, and he said, I felt like the goose who laid the golden egg, right. which Good is example. an enormous emotional burden. Right. It also had some secondary gain for, for Katie because it allowed her, I think, a safe way to express her rage against her husband, which mm -hmm. I don't think she had any conventional way of expressing. Yeah. So she wasn't really giving Tom what he wanted. He wanted something valuable, and she was giving him fool's gold. Mm -hmm. So she was giving him the psychic finger. Yeah. In other words, it's saying, like, I've got the power, but not for you, buddy. Right. Exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> well... I think it's um, very significant what you're doing here, trying to look at the psychodynamics behind uh, psychokinesis, because for the most part, researchers are, to the extent that they look at it at all, are still stuck in the is it real phase. Right. I should mention, this is not the only uh, case where interesting PK phenomena occurred in the context of a bad marriage. Mm -hmm. There was a woman in Maryland I studied who is married to somebody with bipolar disorder. Mm. And I think that was another very uh, difficult marriage with that was psychologically and probably physically abusive as well. Yeah. And she would take photographs in which cloudy shapes would appear where there was no cloud in the original scene, and also some cloudy spaghetti-like squiggles mm -hmm. that would appear in the yeah. uh, camera. Needles to say there were no actual spaghetti-like squiggles in the scene. Mm -hmm. And one picture she took was of her husband glaring angrily, apparently, into the camera. And off to the right of his face were some squiggles that seemed to spell out the word help. Oh. So it's hard to know whether that was an expression of the, the woman herself who took the photo yeah. or her husband's 
cry for help? Well, I suppose it's safe to say that there are many more people with emotional disturbances and troubled marriages than there are cases of macro PK. So far as we know. Yeah. So, so while the emotional tension uh, is a contributing factor, it must re also require a level of native talent. Um, or the right combination of background conditions, I don't really know. I mm -hmm. mean, it may be that it's something we're all capable of if things get serious enough or extreme enough mm -hmm. or opportunities arise. Mm -hmm. But sure, we don't have massive reports of macro PK, but we do have lots of poltergeist cases. Yeah. Well, how many would you say we have? Po Poltergeist? Yeah. That I don't know. I and mean, when you say lots, it's it's nowhere near the number of people who have emotional disturbances. No, of course. Right? There are other ways of dealing with yeah. emotional problems. They're right. not all going to come out. I'm, I'm going to guess that the, the, the number of people who are emotionally disturbed uh, who also exhibit uh, psychokinesis is maybe one in a thousand. Well, similarly, people who suffer trauma don't all become multiples. I mean, right. there are other ways of dealing with trauma. So yeah. there are other ways of dealing with uh, uh, emotional problems. These are relatively are. rare conditions. Yes, presumably so. But I don't think we can jump to the conclusion that it means that few people have the requisite PK talent. Mm -hmm. It may just require the right kind of background conditions. And, and surely there's social factors that tend to suppress, I think, a, a lot of native ability that people have. We get very little reward or encouragement for uh, growing in this direction. Uh, no, coming out of the PK closet is not really on a par with being a child molester, but uh, uh, it's a way of asking for trouble. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, with regard to Katie, sure. uh, some of the work she did with law enforcement was quite impressive. Very impressive. Um, I interviewed, there was a very interesting case of a robbery on St. John, or John's Island, which is near Vero Beach where Katie lives. Mm -hmm. And a large quantity of jewelry had been stolen from a house. And I spoke to the chief of security on the island. He had been unable to solve the crime. And he had heard about Katie's virtuosity and he figured he had nothing to lose. So he and some of his associates drove Katie around the island. Um, he was very careful not to give away by releasing the gas pedal uh, where the house was. He just mm -hmm. drove around the island, often coasting down the streets, mm -hmm. um, seeing if Katie could identify the house. She not only identified the house, she correctly described the decor inside the house. She described the box from which the jewelry had been taken. She correctly identified and described the maid who worked mm -hmm. in the house. She identified or described three sub subjects. Uh, suspects, suspects, where there had really only been two known to the mm -hmm. uh, uh, police. And she gave so many correct details that initially the chief of security uh, was tempted to regard Katie as a suspect herself. Mm -hmm. But it turned out that her clues allowed uh, them to solve the crime and to recover almost an, all the $185,000 worth of stolen jewelry. That's quite amazing. Yes. But it suggests then that there's a relationship between extrasensory abilities and psychokinetic abilities. I wonder about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly Katie seemed to be an all-around psychic I mean, with mediumistic yeah. talents, ESP abilities, um, PK abilities. But I don't know how common that is. I mean, mm -hmm. often we find people who are good at one but not the other. Yeah. Well, you've, you've specialized in looking at cases of psychokinesis. Have you found such cases of strong PK where there was no ESP? Good question. Um, I've certainly found PK subjects who don't demonstrate any ESP that I'm aware of. Okay. Uh, certainly not in the flagrant uh, virtuosic way that Katie does. Yeah. Uh-huh. So what you're saying is these abilities need not be connected. I don't think so, any more than a musician needs to have the entire complement of musical abilities to be a great musician. Okay. So it, it or an be, athlete needs to have the entire complement of athletic abilities to be a great Well, the, I, I, I suppose the telling fact is that there's, even though research into this type of phenomenon has been going on for 150 years, there are so few researchers that we still know so very little about it. Absolutely. And we're certainly, as you know, I feel we're certainly not going to figure these things out by looking at laboratory experiments. 
No, they need to go to the field. The case studies are, are very, very important, but typically somebody such as yourself will do an extensive case study on a, a very bizarre case uh, like that of Katie, and other researchers will read about it, but many of them have a very hard time digesting this material. And what they're more likely to do is to just dismiss it for all the wrong reasons. There mm -hmm. was a, uh, the TV show Unsolved Mysteries did a segment on Katie. Uh -huh. And while it was basically favorable, uh, NBC felt obliged to consult their half skeptic, Paul Kurtz. And so Paul had his students uh, in New York try to explain away Katie's phenomena without making any effort to understand the conditions under which the yeah. phenomena erupted. So Paul Kurtz thought he and his students could explain it away by buying some composition leaf, applying it to one of the students with hairspray, mm -hmm. and um, walking around with it all day. And using so the hairspray to stick it to yes. the body. Now, I uh -huh. had this material carefully analyzed. There was never traces of any stuff like hairspray on it. Mm -hmm. And besides, it doesn't address what's most interesting about the case, which is that it would appear spontaneously and instantaneously in front of people. Yeah. Not just that they found it already there. <laughs> With hairspray. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, since you bring up the fact that Paul Kurtz is a professional philosopher, such as yourself, uh, it strikes me that within the discipline of philosophy, particularly contemporary American philosophy, there is a movement. I think it's known by different names, but one of them is naturalism, uh, which just says out of hand, anything that seems to be transcendental or, or supernormal or paranormal is simply out of bounds. It must be fraud. And, and we can assume that without any further analysis. Well. That seems to me to be so transparently foolish, it's hard to imagine that anyone could say that, especially when you consider how science is redefined continually what counts as natural. But isn't this a dominant movement in philosophy? It's one. Uh -huh. um, and it seems as unlikely to go away as skepticism generally, whether it's skepticism mm -hmm. about religion or skepticism about psi or, or what have I mean, I think it goes back, I could be wrong, to David Hume, the Scottish philosopher who once wrote that anybody who reports a miracle must be uh, engaged in or susceptible to fraud. Hume is often cited as uh, the inspiration for this, although Hume scholars will debate exactly what Hume's position is. And yeah. I don't think we need to get into this no. at all. No, but it, it does seem to go back to that yes, kind of yes. thinking. Yes, you're right. That it's, it's just automatically we can assume fraud if, if somebody starts talking about the paranormal. Makes it very hard to investigate cases like this and be taken seriously, mm -hmm. which is one of the nice things about having tenure. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a rare bird in, in the philosophical community that you've achieved uh, a level of prominence and, and still maintained. In fact, pretty much the bulk of your publications are in the parapsychology domain. Prominence, but sh shipped off to the side. Yeah. Um, I've had people say very strange things to me. One prominent logician said, and I think this was meant as a compliment, if anyone has to do this, I'm glad it's you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've done an admirable job, and, and I know even within uh, the parapsychology community to talk about and to focus on macro PK makes you something of an outsider even there. Um, yeah, I guess that's true, and fortunately, I'm not uncomfortable with that. Yeah, nor am I. I no, mean, I know. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think we're kindred spirits. In, in, that, in that sense, we are, because uh, it's understandable to me that people get their minds blown by this phenomenon. Because uh, first of all, it's so rare, and second of all, it just seems impossible. Well, I mean, as someone who studied the Ted Owens case, you ought to yeah. know. Yeah. Well, in, in the Ted Owens case had an additional uh, clowning UFO. feature, and that is that he was a frightening person. Yes, he, people he would he would threaten people and and follow up on the threats. So there is this that is an added dimension for sure. Uh huh. But Pete, Katie wasn't like that. Katie was a lovely person, or mm -hmm. is as far as I know. Mm -hmm. um, is the phenomena continuing? I've been out of touch with her since Bert died several years ago. Yeah. Um, but Katie was, I have to say, a perfectly cooperative subject. 
She had no philosophical or religious axe to grind. She wasn't interested in being a professional psychic. She has stayed out of um, the limelight whenever possible. Mm -hmm. And so, unlike many psychic superstars, yeah. she was very easy to work with and had nothing to gain except the occasional attention of distinguished philosophers such as myself. Yeah, the opposite of a Ted Owens yes, right. kind of person. But right. it goes to show you that a macro PK can be exhibited by a, a person who seems normal in most other regards. Except for the brass leaf breaking out spontaneously on her face. Yeah. She was a, a very normal person. Mm -hmm. Her emotional problems were not uh, beyond what 50% of the population. I would say so. Uh, has to no, deal lovely with. lady. Yeah. Well, it's uh, quite an adventure that uh, you've been on. How would you say that um, the parapsychology community has uh, been able to integrate this data? I see people citing it from time to time, so mm -hmm. they aren't just ignoring the case, and yeah. I'm gratified about that. And you had the University of Chicago Press, as I recall, publish your book. Um, yes, they may regret that now, but uh, um, they published Charlie Tart's early study in ESP as well, so mm -hmm. uh, good for them. Good for them. Well, Stephen Browdy, once again, thank you so much for being with me. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you for being with us. Mm -hmm.